Send your Holy Spirit over our hearts and inspire us. We love your word every day a little more and fashion our lives according to the lovely design of your word. We pray through Christ alone. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. We've had quite a journey this week, uh, this last four days, and today we're going to just kind of wrap it up, but as I was uh, looking at what we have done and what we might do, I realized that there's a lot, there, there, there are many, many miles to, to travel yet before we finish. <laughs> uh, so I've added one or two things I've we're going to just concentrate on one single uh, passage, but as we read this, as we get into it, we are going to uh, learn a few tips about how to interpret any text of the Bible. Uh, so what we're doing in Luke is not just trying to pick up the the little nuggets of, of some, some things about the Gospel of Luke, but any Gospel, or any song, or any or Genesis, or Exodus. And, and it struck me that we cannot read, I mentioned this, but I haven't underlined it, we cannot read a text without its context and have a full in, in interpretation. For example, uh, the Gospel of the Day, which we read, some of us read in our in our missal or we read in our Bible every day, uh, to, just to kind of stay with the, the the reading of the church and our own spiritual life. We we eat the the bread of the word every day, even if we can't get to mass. Um, but it would be it's a good idea once in a while to just find out now where where are we in the Gospel of Matthew? What comes before and what comes after? And that helps us understand what. Uh, what Jesus is, is how Jesus is forming us by the word of the, the gospel. We've been reading the book of Hosea. Uh, well, we just, we read almost the entire book of Amos last week in the first reading of the gospel. Quite a, a bit of almost every chapter of Amos in Hosea. We, we skipped most of the book. I, since we, we started with chapter 11, <coughs> 13, 14, but to know where we are in the Bible. So this Zacchaeus, before and after, I realized this is really important for the formation of Luke's community in the year, 50 years after the resurrection. We're talking about second generation Christians who did not know Christ. And that's for whom? For whom is the gospel written? It's not for the, it's not, the gospel was not written, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, was not written for the people who knew Jesus. It was written for the next generation. It's for their, their children and the newcomers who were forming the church. And that's us. We're the second generation. And we're, we, we need to contact the first generation, and that would be the gospels. So Zacchaeus, and it just struck me this morning, that, that is a one up there. That's not a ten. <laughs> oh, it is one. It's one, 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 one. It says one to ten. Okay, good. Um, so that's, uh, let's just look at what's going on uh, in, in Zacchaeus, uh, before and after Zacchaeus. Now, where is Zacchaeus in the gospel? Chapter 19. Okay, how many chapters in the gospel? 21. Okay, that means, okay, it's we're getting close. <laughs> so we're getting close, and so it's so warming, up, warming up to the to the passion, to the mystery of the passion. And passion is death and resurrection. <laughs> passion, death, and resurrection. So that's the, that's the, the capsule. We're getting, we're warming up now too. And so uh, Zacchaeus, now Luke had a lot of information, but he's organizing it in a certain way. 
perform his community. And it struck me, who is his community? Uh, we find out by looking at the context here. Now what do I have here? Chapter 18, the chapter just before Zacchaeus, we have got, oh, we've got two parables. A parable of a persistent widow and judge, which is seems to be a prayer of <laughs> the insistence of God for the conversion of the judge who doesn't want to give the woman her rights. Or it's a it's a parable about prayer. Most of us, when we read the heading in the Bible, it's, it's like being persistent in prayer. So we're with women being persistent. But there's another way of reading it. So let's give ourselves the freedom to read it for all its richness. The parable of the persistent widow and judge, okay, that's all right. A poor person and a person who's settled in society. Well, does that have anything to do with the, with the gospel, with the community of Luke in Antioch, metropolitan city? Parable of the Pharisee and the tax collector. Again, we have a public official, and we have a religious leader, and then we have this this, this saying: whoever exalts, whoever uh, raises him or herself up high, will be humbled, and the humbles will be raised up. Okay, what does that have to do with Zacchaeus? who climbed a tree to see Jesus, and Jesus said, well, well come down, get your feet on the ground. So there's, there's something there that's going on in the community of Luke, in our own lives, that has something to do with it. Uh, sitting on children, the sitting on children and the kingdom of God. Well, to be uh, a member of the kingdom of God, uh, we, we must become... Um, what? Gossip? Free? Gossip. What would, what would a child be? A believer. A believer. Believing. Believing in Santa Claus? Yeah. yeah. I mean, really, believing beyond reason. Um, people were bringing infants to him that he might touch them. And when the, the disciples saw this, he the children in the back. Jesus called the children to himself. Let the children come to me. Do not prevent them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Whoever does not accept the kingdom of God like a child will not enter it. Now, is that relating to, to Zacchaeus in any way? Who climbs trees? <laughs> <Children>. <laughs> Squirrels, <laughs> raccoons, and children. Little boys and little girls. So, so that uh, it struck me. It were, uh, Luke is, is kind of priming his, his uh, readership, his community, to understand something about entering into Jerusalem, entering into the passion, uh, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Then we have the rich official who became sad. Now, question. You know the story. Somebody comes. Now, in one of the Gospels, it's a young man, so he doesn't have a lot of money. Uh, another one has a rich person came to Jesus and said, what do I have to do to attain eternal life? What does Jesus say? Yes. If you want to be perfect, so, and, and, and follow me. So, everything and follow me. Give to the poor and put salt and water. Did that person stay with Jesus or did he leave? Okay, he left in Mark. He left in Matthew. In Luke, he didn't leave. In Luke, he became sad. But it doesn't say he left. Now that, that says something about our community. That says about something about Luke's community. Where am I? Uh, when Jesus heard this, uh, all of these I have observed in my youth, for my youth. Jesus heard this. I'm in, uh, what does he say, uh, 20, 18, uh, 22. When Jesus heard this, he said to him, there's still one thing left. 
Sell all that you have, distribute it to the poor, and you will have a treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. In the other gospel, it says, he left, and he was sad. That's Mark. Who was sad? Jesus? <laughs> if we follow syntax and, and semantics, uh, uh, grammar, it was Jesus who was sad <laughs> because the young man left. If we, if we read it in, in the original, we'll, we'll find that Jesus is the... Is the uh, but in Mark, in Matthew, it's the, the rich man was sad. But in Luke, it just says, when he heard this, he became sad, for he was very rich. Now, there's a possibility here. If we just have Luke and we don't have Mark or Matthew, we would think, oh, well, he stayed in the community. But he, he stayed with kind of, well, I'm not doing enough. Or, or I should have done more, or, or I, I'm just not really comfortable yet. I'm not able to, to do all I, I want to do. Isn't that kind of where we are sometimes in life? <laughs> it's not a, it's not a, Luke is, is building us up. Um, we are in, in the community as we are. And, and sometimes we have those moments of, well, maybe I'm just, just not quite making the mark. But I'm still here. And that's so all right. I know he had a bad outcome, do we? No. And and uh, and Luke doesn't doesn't answer the no, question. We want we want that movie to stop, you know, yeah. have a happy ending. No, it ends like kind of one of these Parisian movies. <laughs> 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 this movies that just don't have a happy ending and they just leave you think of hanging like it wasn't a happy ending. <laughs> then we have um, <laughs> I put here, the rich official who became sad. Right. But he stayed with the community, possibly, on riches and renunciation. Now here we have the camel and the needle's eye. <laughs> Uh, what is that uh, parable about? About entering the reign of God. Jesus. Um, it is easy. Uh, Jesus looked at. Oh! Jesus looked at this rich official and said, How hard it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. Where it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard this said, who can be saved? And Jesus said, what is impossible for human beings is possible for God. So Jesus is saying, yeah, he's all right. He's sad, but he's all right because God is bigger. Now, what's that camel and the needle's eye all about? This is the needle. Okay, I've read it. Uh, I've read the same uh, footnote as you have. <laughs> but uh, so the camel is a camel, bigger than a horse, and the needle's eye is a little door on the side of the big door that they call the needle's eye. You know, we've never found that door. <laughs> in, in, we study archaeology and so um, I would say there's another possibility there Jesus knew very well how big is a needle and Jesus knew very well how difficult it is in the back of a, a house which is poorly lit in Nazareth how difficult it would have been for his mother when he she was mending the canvas that was used over the front of the house, or or she was mending her clothing, the cloak of Joseph, uh, and she was not using goat's hair or uh, 
uh, sheep's wool. She was using a thicker thread made of camel hair. And to uh, when when our lady, and I'm sure Jesus was there, and Jesus was there contemplating his mother sewing, and to uh, insert the insert the, the fringed edge of the thread into the into the needle's eye, she had to kiss a miss a kiss the the, the end of the thread and then with her eyesight and and then thread that needle. It was difficult. What did Paul, St. Paul, I'm not changing the subject, what did St. Paul, what was his uh, office? What, how did he uh, fund his missionary activity? He made tents. He was making tents out of what? Camel hair. Because it's, it's uh, durable and it's, uh, if you treat it right, it's, it's not going to, the, it's impermeable. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's the water, water doesn't sink through. So, so Paul mended uh, canvas and, and tent things. Um, uh, Tabitha did the same thing, although Tabitha had a, had a very nice clothes, clothing industry. Uh, so she wasn't just using camel hair. But, um, and she was, was dying at purple, which is a very, very special process. <coughs> Acts of the Apostles. So um, this camel is not just the animal. It's also the produce of the animal. Camel milk, camel wool, camel, camel bread, camel uh, hair. And so, uh, yes, it's difficult. So we don't have to necessarily think of a huge camel and just a needle. We could think of a camel hair, but it's difficult. Do it. <laughs> but with God you can do it. That kiss of the Holy Spirit <laughs> will will uh, that's not a Conradism. Actually I I, I have shared that with other exegetes. So here we have again riches and how difficult it is. But Luke is uh, consoling his community because they're they're living in on a certain comfort level, and, and they want to be Christians. But they 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 they're not going to get rid of their house. Yes, they're going to maybe uh, you know, help people around them. You know, uh, make everybody poor. Uh, then uh, we have the healing of the blind beggar. Okay. Uh, no, yeah, the third passion prediction. Twice over the last uh, seven chapters, Jesus has said, we're going to Jerusalem. Uh, I will be betrayed. You will be betrayed. I will be betrayed by my friends. I will be uh, scourged. I will be, uh, I will die. And I will be raised. Third passion tradition. And we're getting ready to go into Jerusalem. Then we have the healing of the blind beggar. Now this is a blind beggar in Jericho. Where does... Where does Zacchaeus live? Well, Jesus healed the blind beggar in lower Jericho, just coming into Jericho. And then as he's going out of Jericho, he's in the heights of Jericho. So he's, he's with the, going through uh, a nicer district where people are living. And it's there where Zacchaeus has his tax office and also his home, his villa. That's where Herod had his villas. That's where some of the, the upper crust of Jerusalem had their had their homes, their very nice homes in Upper Jericho. And so there we have healing of a blind beggar. Well, did the gossip of Jesus having healed a blind person coming into Jericho, did that reach the, uh, the papers? Did that, did that reach? Did Zacchaeus know that Jesus healed a blind person? And Zacchaeus, his problem is he can't see. He is blind in another way. Because, okay, everybody, let's get ready for a, a photo here. 
Turkey went front. <laughs> well, Zacchaeus just couldn't get, he couldn't see, and so he had to make himself bigger. And then we have a parable of the investment of gold coins. Uh, I'll give 10 of you one gold coin a piece. Now, you invest that coin. It's a, this, none of this exists in Matthew and Mark. It's all Luke training his own community to be at peace with themselves and with their community living, with their faith. And so, the parable of the investment of gold coins, he didn't say, give the coin away. He said, invest it. Uh, make it work for you and for your salvation. And if you just, you know, put it under the mattress and uh, put it in your socket and, and, and hide it, well, it's no good to anybody, neither yourself nor anybody else. And that's, it's, Luke is talking to his community. He's talking to us, really. As always, a parable of, of the investment of gold coins. Invest your talents. And your talents are... Your most precious talent is time. Secondly, health. Thirdly, patience, happiness. <laughs> uh, the, uh, those are the talents that we're talking about when we get to St. Paul. And then entry into Jerusalem, <coughs> and we know the rest of the story. So these, these two chapters are extremely important for the formation of the uh, community of Ruth. Context is important to be able to read uh, any one of these things. What comes before and what comes after. And when you're reading the scripture, studying the scripture, uh, check what's coming before and after. And that might give us a key as to what this passage is all about. Any um, comment on that part? That's that's the macro vision. <laughs> so um, I'm thinking of Father Pascal talking about Lexio on the reading of the day. And he said, what can I get out of this? I've heard this story so many times. We looked at it. And he it turned out to be one of his richer Lexio experiences. So you can look at it one time and see these different things like you're mentioning, but maybe there's another step yes. the next time you hear. Exactly. Uh, in our lectionary cycle uh, for the Office of Vigils, which we've been attending these days, the office at 5 o'clock in the morning, um, you know, I've seen, I've been through that cycle two-year cycle of scripture readings, I've been through that cycle 24 times. Mm -hmm. But this year, we're reading, uh, we're reading a couple of the prophets, and, and I thought, oh, have I ever read that in my life? <laughs> because there were, there were new lights, you know, and I was thinking, well, I wasn't ready for it the last time I read it. But this, and so I got something, but this time it was just kind of like, wow, oh, it's like fireworks. I think going off in my in my heart, <laughs> uh, asking me to convert in a new way that I wasn't aware of two years ago, or mm -hmm. four years ago, or six years ago, or eight years ago, when I heard the same reading. Uh, is that kind of where we are here? Thank you. Anything else? Just a note from our Orthodox friends that the, the Zacchaeus story is read every year on the fifth Sunday before Lent, we get so there's something about this story that for the Orthodox is so important that they want it to be used as part of the formation to enter into Lent. It's, it's this Zacchaeus story in the Orthodox lectionary is uh, on the fifth Sunday before Lent. Before Lent, so it would be ordinary time. Almost right. ordinary time, but, but really preparing us to go. And the lectionary really is a catechesis. We follow the lectionary, the Sunday lectionary, that is a catechesis for our Christian life. Um, 
uh, and, and in the Orthodox tradition, this reading apparently is very important for getting us ready for Lent. What I gather. <laughs> Something that I've heard in, in another retreat is um, that a lot of these encounters that Jesus has with people, of course, he's the son of God. He knows what's going to happen. But at the same time, he's having an encounter himself with these people. So that's kind of interesting how um, Zacchaeus is there in the tree and, and he has that surprise encounter in a way. So him having that relationship, too. That's really no, I didn't think. Jesus himself yes. is having these encounters, and uh, Luke is recording, one of the evangelists is recording, uh, also Luke's, uh, Jesus's, um, his development, and, and don't be uh, scandalized because Jesus does have aha moments when, when oh, I didn't, yeah, you're right, you know, uh, We've got to give, we have to have a feeding now for the people who weren't there the first time, <laughs> who didn't arrive on time. Thank you. Okay, um, let's try. Is this readable? Okay, I the underlying stuff is just for me, but you can, you can look at it too. Some of the things that, uh, what I do is, I take the text, I put it in context, what's going on before and after, and then what I do is I read the text, and I read the text again, and the second or third time I read the text, I undermine the words or phrases that either I don't understand or that uh, really are beginning to make sense in the gospel. Um, so Jericho, Zacchaeus, uh, chief tax collector, wealthy, seeking. Okay, we have seeking here. We have seeking here. We call that in literary criticism inclusion or a mark, a, a frame, a frame. The frame is seeking and seeking. Uh, somebody here is seeking, but Jesus is also seeking. And we as Benedictines are seeking. Uh, what's the primary or only uh, condition for deciding whether a young man or a young woman is apt for uh, Benedictine life? If to see, to discern if he is truly seeking God. It's not how bad he is or how talented he or she is, or it's not a, it's, it's, is his heart truly seeking God? Have we found him? Well, we've got a pretty good idea of what the Catechism says, but have we really found God? Oh, I'm still seeking. I would say I'm still a novice. <laughs> After 49 years, I'm, I'm a perpetual novice. <laughs> We're seeking. God, we as Benedictines. Okay? And then, not only seeking, but looking up and seeing, I found. And then we have, uh, what I underlined here was, oh, we've got all this vertical access. Okay? It's, we have a horizontal vision, but this is uh, us all about tra tracing the, uh, the line from, from bottom, from ground to, to heaven. We have person on the ground who climbs a tree, Jesus says, Jesus looks up and then says, come down, and he comes down and he stands on the ground. And so there's there's the vertical axis, the horizontal axis, that's caught my attention, and then stood where on the ground and seeking. And um, obviously, Abraham, I should have underlined because that's, Abraham is where the poor Lazarus is in his bosom in the parable two chapters earlier. And so that's that's nice. Abraham is, well, Zacchaeus is a religious man. He goes to Mass every Sunday. But he doesn't feel very good about 
himself, and he knows that Jesus has the, a bigger answer, or a better answer. So, uh, Jesus said to him, Today, <laughs> salvation has come to this house because this man, too, is a descendant of Abraham. He's uh, something that the rich man in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, yes, he was a descendant of Abraham, but he, he was left. He found himself outside because his, he didn't have this Zacchaeus experience of changing his attitude, changing his attitude. It's not all about changing behavior. It's about changing attitude. Conversion is a shift in our mental attitudinal process. It's not just uh, behavior. Let's read it and have uh, and respond to this text. What does it say? <laughs> he entered Jericho and passed through the town. Now there is a Jesus, a chief tax collector and a wealthy man, was seeking to see who Jesus was, but he could not see him because of the crowd, for he was short in stature. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree to see Jesus, who was about to pass that way. When he reached the place, Jesus looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down quickly, for today I must stay at your house. So he came down quickly and received him with joy. When they all saw this, they began to grumble, saying, He has gone to stay at the sinner's house. But Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, half of my possessions, Lord, I shall give to the poor. And if I have extorted anything from anyone, I shall repay it four times over. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a descendant of Abraham. For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save what was lost. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, what catches your attention? Yes. He stayed at, he's, I'm coming to stay at your house. Yeah. Jesus invited himself into Zacchaeus, had no intention of having dinner with him, but Jesus made the appointment in, in Zacchaeus. Thank you. He ran ahead and he, climbed. He ran ahead and climbed. Good. Yeah. Zacchaeus received him with joy and stood. Okay, that joy we have seen many times, and that is uh, very Lucan. Uh, his community uh, likes to be happy. <laughs> Thank you. What else? Zacchaeus stood. He stood. He's, uh, he's, he stands. Do you know what the word amen means? I believe. I believe. Yeah. Oh, so be it. So be it. So be it. I stand. I, I'm placing myself there. Body of Christ, yes, I am there. I'm standing there. Amen in Hebrew is much more phys physiological than it is in, in Latin and, and English. Uh, in Greek, it's, it's a word. It's a, it's, a, it's a Hebrew word that has come into our language. <laughs> so, kind of a reversal. Good, good. Yes, Christ came to seek those who are seeking. Good. Yes. Um. Uh, right after verse, or it is verse five. Uh, Today I must stay at your house, and for everyone to hear that. Um. Uh, do we, uh, that made me think, do I uh, be with someone who is uh, um, maybe not a very good Christian or someone who I don't know what their their belief is, but 
to be kind to them, that helped to draw them toward listening about Christ. That's how I took that. I must stay at your house. Because to go to the house, you can imagine how Jacqueline really felt when me, you know, you're coming to my house? Yes. And, and I like that. So this is, uh, this, this today I must stay at your house, at your house. Now that's, that's, uh, that, yes, it does invite us to, to think. And then we have, of course, <clears throat> today. Salvation has come to this house. Today I must stay at your house. Today salvation has come to this house. And the first time that we hear today in the Gospel of Luke is, Today, a child has been born in Bethlehem. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, whenever Jesus does anything, someone has a negative comment. But in this, they all saw it and they began to grumble. So uh, everybody whose house he didn't stay at is upset. Okay. When Jesus does something, and something surprising and good, people usually grumble. Or somebody grumbles. But here everybody's grumbling. <laughs> because they didn't stay at their house. And they were perhaps more worthy. Thank you, Barbara. Yes, please. Something that I've noticed several times <coughs> has been the passing by. Jesus is passing by. Jesus is passing through. Jesus is passing by. He stops. We've heard that several, a few times this week. And, and he's passing by and he stops. He's passing by and he's stopped. Yes. Just a question. Um, as a tax collector in Jericho, would he have to be Jewish? Because Jesus says he's a descendant of Abraham, which could mean he's an Ishmaelite, not Ishmaelite. <laughs> <laughs> Jericho, um, you know, and it's, it's on this side of the border, I would say his Ishmaelite cousins live across the river. Uh, although Jericho was, was also, it was a big commercial city. Jericho is the shopping mall, it's the Wall Street, and it's, uh, it's the market, it's the neighborhood, I mean it's the big market. Uh, so, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people around. And because, uh, Tim, I think you're looking at, and, and, and rightfully so, this man, too, maybe not by birth, but has become a descendant of Abraham. Uh, and Abraham is also the father of all believers, not just uh, a Jewish people. More information. Uh, yes, you have a comment. Oh, no, I was just wondering, when it said they all... When they all saw this again, he began to grumble, and I was wondering who was grumbling. Is it the the crowd, or was it his disciples who were obviously traveling with him? But they don't refer to the disciples in the text. So, okay, so the grumbling does. There's a reaction to what Jesus has just done, and there often is a reaction to what Jesus has done, and that's also a, a wake up call to, to us. Well, yeah, where how are we with that? Good. So uh, Jericho is the plaza, it's the shopping mall, it's the business world, and it's the resort. It's Las Vegas, and a little more. In the parable, uh, in Jericho also is, uh, Jesus tells a parable about a person who went from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he was, uh, and he was mugged. Um, and that's a place where people are mugged. Some of us as well have walked that road from uh, Jerusalem to Jericho. In Jericho, a blind man has received his sight. Right before this uh, etymology of Zacchaeus, I just came across this a month ago. Actually, I was thinking about you all. And I thought, well, I do etymologies of all the names in the first two chapters of Luke. And, and there is a there's a, a, there's a tapestry of theology just by taking the, the names and what they mean in their Hebrew names 
Zechariah with Elizabeth and Mary and Anna and Simeon and Fanuel and Asher, all of those names at the beginning, but I've never done it in the rest of the club. I mean, I just, it didn't strike me that Zacchaeus must mean something. Also, I checked it out. Zacchaeus in Greek, Zacchaeus, is Hebrew Zacchae. And I thought, well, Zacchae, I'm a Hebrew teacher, it means pure, it means innocent. So, um, from the, from the verb zaka, which is to be clean, to be pure, zakaios would be God and purity, God and innocence. Um, and I wondered what that's all about. I'm still meditating on it. The short stature of this man is very important in uh, this uh, gospel. He's, he's short both physically and morally short. He's a little man. He's a tax collector and he's wealthy. That's really interesting for Luke and his community. The episode begins and concludes with search and seek, and uh, Jesus is the one who's seeking this lost sheep. Um, and he finds it. He's seeing and looking is important here. When they all saw this, and we have we see something and we have our own prejudgments about things. But uh, Zacchaeus also was looking for, and Jesus was seeing. So there's seeing on all levels here. Uh, there's a, a lot of movement in here. Just underlying the verbs. Jesus entered. Jesus was going through the town. Zacchaeus ran ahead. He climbed a sycamore tree to catch a glimpse of Jesus. Jesus looked up and spoke to the shrimp in the tree. Come down quickly. And he did quickly descend it. So there's, there's movement, 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 movement. And then today, two glances converge. One from below and the other from above. Little Zacchaeus climbed a sycamore tree to get a better vantage point, and the Son of God descended from heaven in search of those of us of small stature. Two glances with one thing in common, the search. Zacchaeus was seeking to see who Jesus is, and Jesus was seeking to save the lost. Verse 3 and 10. Jesus and Zacchaeus meet. Divine mercy contacts misery, midget humanity. The son of Abraham collaborated with foreign political interests. That quizzing rebel sheep, has ascended the ladder to an executive position among the fiscal officers, the tax authorities, and the now head honcho had been bought. We think of the call of Levi. When was Levi, the tax collector, called? When he was in the Blessed Sacrament Chapel? No. no. He, was, he was counting his his money. He was counting the money. You know uh, the, the, the marvelous um, painting. Just slipped my mind. Um, by um, where uh, of, the, of the call of Matthew Caravaggio. Caravaggio. The call of Matthew. Uh, it's in uh, San Luis, uh, which is St. Saint, Saint Louis, uh, Saint Louis and, and our friends. And what you have there is all of us are in the dark. But Matthew is over there. There's a window behind Jesus, and the light is coming from that window 
and the light in this in this painting is hitting the hand of Jesus and his finger. And then the light is hitting Matthew, who's hunched over his money. There's some sparkling money there, but but the hand of Matthew, Levi, is going like <laughs> oh, me? <laughs> you gotta be kidding. No, it's like Je Mike, Jesus, Matthew. Matthew was called in the act of sinning. <laughs> and, and, and here we have, that was in chapter 6. Now we have um, Zacchaeus, who is a, a known public sinner. Um, when Jesus was passing through Jericho, the midget wanted to see him at any cost. But on account of his size, physical stature reflected in his moral character. Uh, hampered by the crowd. This little big guy ran ahead, climbed a tree, a ridiculous perch from which to satisfy his curiosity. And there he met a man who would be raised up and hung from the tree of the cross. And from there he would save humanity. Now, um, the document from the uh, Pontifical Biblical Commission that was published in 1970, uh, 1993, that is a document that is uh, still uh, not very much known in, in Catholic biblical circles, but it's a, it's a uh, very, very important document for those of us who love the Word of God. Because it's giving us freedom to, to interpret the, the Word of God along with the fathers of the church, along with scientific exegesis, along with languages, and along with the social sciences and archaeology. And so um, this is probably going to scandalize some of you, but, but right now, you know, when we do spirituality, read a spiritual reading of the sacred scripture, we often are also doing some kind of, I, I don't want to say psychotherapy because it's not psychoanalysis or psychotherapy, but we are, we, are, uh, we are talking about our spirituality and we're talking about our emotional life and about our psychological makeup. And so, so here, uh, just to, to um, show, sow the seeds in our, study of the Gospel of Luke, or reading of the Gospel, uh, or reading our Lectio Divina, I'm sharing with you uh, one note. Where is it? Oops. Yeah. This psychological, spiritual approach to the text. Now, this is not <coughs> comment. I'm working with colleagues uh, in, in this, both Jewish and, and Christian. So, uh, Zacchaeus, He's short of stature, stature, and risen high in the financial world. One might say that he was overly conscious of his small size, thus he compensated for his inferior physical status by making a lot of money and making him himself big. He used extortion, the usual practice among the functionaries who bid for a contract with the occupying Romans. To collect taxes. Uh, this is also done by architects, at least in the country where I'm living. Uh, you'll have set a project out for a bid, uh, particularly government projects, and they will, uh, a bid will be several million for uh, the construction of a bridge. And then, after two years after the bridge is constructed, uh, a car is going over the bridge uh, and it uh, the bridge collapses because the money for that project has gone into the pocket of, of, uh, of corruption. The wealthier Zacchaeus became, the more public, the more the public despised him, caught in a vicious circle that many people who suffer from low self-esteem get trapped in. We try to make ourselves bigger 
and ultimately we make ourselves uh, more clumsy, <laughs> clumsier and, and perhaps uglier. The more we seek others' recognition, the more isolated we become. Zacchaeus, the, the little giant of tax collectors, carved out a name for himself by belittling others. By elevating himself, he separated from them. He needed the encounter with Jesus to get his feet on the ground and to see things differently. That would be just a, a tone of what we do also in exegesis when we apply the uh, text to our own, our own reality, uh, personally or, or even in, in society. That's, no, that uh, kind of reading is, it's uh, towards the end of this document, the document is Pontifical Biblical Commission, Interpretation of the Bible in the Catholic Church. And this is, uh, it has all of the signs and seals of, of the Catholic Church. That document is tremendously important. important. Uh, it's uh, not very long. But it goes through the whole process. So had Zacchaeus earlier caught wind of this Jesus who had cured a blind person in Jericho? If a blind, if the blind can be healed, why not a shrimp? <laughs> Look at him. Look at him in the photos, where the shorties are always in front and the tallies are always behind. But outside the photos, Zacchaeus had to stretch. To see things right. Something was always in his way. So for months, he ran ahead and climbed a tree to get, catch a glimpse of the rising star descended from heaven. Might Jesus also have desired to see Zacchaeus? The gospel says nothing other than the Son of Man has come to seek and save what was lost. But how could he, how could Jesus miss a mighty mouse of a man mounted like a target in a sycamore tree <laughs> or like a rare bird that visits the park and grabs everybody's attention because we've never seen a bird like that before. Children climb trees, squirrels and raccoons scramble up trees, but the chief tax collector, a fiscal functionary, it's unheard of. All Jesus had to do was raise his gaze, and that's what he did. The gaze cast by the fisher of men caught a shrimp in a tree. <laughs> As we saw in the healing of the blind man in Jericho, just a few verses earlier, the word, oh, we talked about that yesterday, the verb here is again, anablepo. Anablepo. Blepo is? To see. Uh, on the level is to see again or to look up uh, or restore sight or maybe correct your vision. So on a level, to look upward, I suggest to, trans to contemplate higher ideas, to, to, to look up, to, to appreciate the transcendent amid the, the muddy, murky sort of life that we see every day in it. News or restore the sight. Jesus raised his eyes to see a short man high in a tree. He glimpsed heaven. Jesus glimpsed heaven in a human being. He saw the face of God reflected, reflected in humans. This produced a new sensation in Zacchaeus, who acquired a new stature in the eyes of Jesus. In Jesus, Look, you know, I'm suggesting also that seeing is a very, Jesus look is a very important part of the theology of Luke. More than, happens in Mark, uh, happens here two times in John, but, oh, it's only in Luke when we mentioned this the first day. Peter is over there being tried for his discipleship. Being tried, and his his uh, trial lawyer is uh, a lady, a servant, and and over here Jesus is being tried by public officials, 
And after the rooster crows, Jesus looks and sees, and Peter starts crying. That's only a look. You see that look? Uh, the look of Jesus changes the individual, wakes us up, of being, uh, being looked at by Jesus. And what a sight. Zacchaeus was accustomed to harsh looks, judgmental, evasive eyes, scorn, and distrust. Rarely did somebody look at Zacchaeus a second time. And anyway, these stares were supercharged with contempt. Look there, a traitor to Abraham's race. Because people avoided him, Zacchaeus had sealed himself off in his career, except for that one day when curiosity got the best of him and he climbed a tree to see Jesus. Jesus' attitude and Jesus' look were different from all the rest. He fixed his gaze on Zacchaeus and he embraced the whole personal tragic history of this man. The loneliness, the aloofness, the greed, and the need. Suddenly, Zacchaeus was shaken out of his comfort zone. This look of Jesus was so different from the fierce glares of everybody else. Maybe Zacchaeus had reached the point of simply ignoring the looks because of the numbing, numbing pain that came with them, though he knew in his heart that he deserved cold contempt. But now, a different sort of look, a look that neither hurt nor condemned, but rather opened his wound, wound to heal. This happened just about six days ago. I was in the kitchen, in the, uh, in the pantry, uh, at 4 o'clock in the morning, 4.30 in the morning, I was making a cup of coffee before prayer. And the kitchen master was there, uh, one of the brothers of the community. And I said, good morning. And that's as, as good as it gets at 4.30 in the morning. <laughs> he was over the refrigerator getting ready for break. Set out breakfast and everything. And, and uh, I'd noticed progressions <coughs> and I'd noticed some ugliness in in the last few days, um, particularly from the organ, and I was the celebrant, and so my voice could not contend with the organ. Um, and so, but it wasn't just that, there was other messiness um, for a while. And so I was making my coffee, and brother came over, and he was just, tears were just rolling down his face. And, and he said, you can't forgive me. I've been so mean. I've been so mean. Well, I'm not interested in what you might have done. I'm interested in, in your joy and your happiness and your conversion, if, that, if we want to speak in those terms. And, and really, I don't, I just looked at him, and he just looked at me. He couldn't believe that I wasn't going to punish him or, or <laughs> ask him what for the details or whatever. I just looked at him, and I said, listen, whatever happened yesterday happened yesterday, today is a new day. And so on. And he couldn't believe that I, I guess he knows that I'm not stupid. <laughs> I mean, stupid in the sense that I knew what was happening, but I never responded to them. Because there's a person behind the act, that, and the person is good, but the person is clumsy. And it's the clumsiness that, that maybe we see sometimes, and we, we don't go beyond the clumsiness to see the person. And I see a man there that is a very, very good man. And I just thought, well, this 30-year-old has every right to be a 30-year-old. 
and do wet 30 year olds. But if he does this when he's 60, he better be better. Up until now, the public official had, had exploited his uniform, a crook tolerated by his victims. But Jesus looked like that of the Father, who makes his sun rise on the bad and the good and causes rain to fall on the just and the unjust. Jesus did not discriminate between sinners and the blameless. Jesus had come to Jericho that day to seek the sick, not the healthy, to save sinners, not the righteous. Suddenly, a profound consolation enters Zacchaeus, and he could hardly believe it. Neither could the crowd, and they started to grumble. What next? Was Jesus really speaking to that scumbag? But Jesus not only saw Zacchaeus, he paid attention to him, called him by name, as if he had come to Jericho for an appointment with the, the executive tax official in a sycamore tree. There's more. Jesus not only uh, addressed the miniature big man, but invited himself into his home. Zacchaeus, come down now, because today I must be a guest in your home. That come down now. Oops. Jesus calls him by name, Zacchaeus, come down, hurry. The midget, who wanted to be tall, descends, he gets grounded, connects with, with his humble, earthly, earthly humus, humanist nature. The transformation occurred not on the vertical axis, but Zacchaeus had to get grounded. He can't Put your feet on the ground. Based on his contact with Jesus, the earthly man was transformed and discovered his true nature. Zacchaeus experienced salvation that friendship with Jesus affords. He came to assess his own life on a deeper level, from a different point of view. He, Zacchaeus began to see things differently. And there's that conversion, which is now uh, promised in his own giving, uh, making up the different, uh, making up four times over, if he has cheated anyone. And the glowering Pharisees grumbled in their teeth. Look how Jesus visits the house of a thief. For sure, Zacchaeus was corrupt but no less deserving of mercy. And Jesus' declaration rings true. The Son of Man came to seek and save what is lost. Only one remedy mends the tear and the wound of sin. Mercy, always bigger than our little heart, and always abundant where sin is found. Like the lady at Jesus' feet in Simon's house, first the grace of pardon, and what follows is our grateful response. Forgiveness first, then love. One day in Jericho, Jesus sought the sinner, who once found, imitated Jesus, and remunerated the victims of his double dealing. The gospel not only announces the good news of mercy, but invites us to offer the same mercy to our confreres, to our families, to our guests. What does St. Benedict counsel? Again, I'm in that chapter, the National Anthem of Benedict's Rule, what is it? <laughs> 72, we did it every day or every week. By most fervent love, therefore, let the Benedictines exercise this zeal, that is, let them prefer one another in honor. Let them most patiently tolerate their infirmities, whether physical or of character. 
So let us rise from our littleness, open ourselves to the heart of mercy, so salvation might come and lodge in our heart and in our homes. So this gospel is not just about little and Zacchaeus who wanted to see Jesus, branded by his contemporaries as unworthy of salvation. It's about us. It's about our community. It's about uh, our society. And um, who of us does not wish to seek, does not seek Jesus? We all do. Who would not go out on a limb and gladly receive Jesus in her home or his home and in exchange receive and duplicate the salvation that Jesus freely offers? Well, uh, thank you for your uh, time. Refer nothing to the love of Christ. May God bring us all together to everlasting life. Thank you. It's been wonderful being with you.